Hello, everyone. My name is Hakin Lee. I'm an associate professor of the TIU eTrack Intensive Relations Program. Welcome. I would like to introduce the TIU Go Dialogue. The dialogue is a speaker series organized by Tokyo International University's eTrack IR Intensive Relations Program. Established in 2019, the TIU Global Dialogue brings top experts, academics, policy practitioners from many fields of international relations, such as politics, diplomacy, military economics, and industry, to TIU to share research findings and discuss issues of strategic importance to Japan and the world. And today, it is our honor to have Professor DBS Annard with us. In fact, the first time I met with Professor Anna was in 2008, when I was only a PhD student. A decade later, we both met in Hong Kong for discussing some collaborations between our universities. And now, Professor Anna is the head of the School of Social Science at University of Westminster in London. His research areas cover a wide range of topics from Indian nationalism, the territorial dispute between China and India, South Asian regional politics to Tibetan issue. Professor Anna has received various research grants, such as British Academic Grant on China's Tibet, the British Association for South Asian Studies Grant on Geopolitics, and Boundary Making in Southern Indian Relations. He was also a visiting fellow at Australian National University. His latest publication is a journal paper on colonizations with Chinese characteristics politics of insecurity in Xinjiang and Tibet. For time constraint, please forgive me that I'm not going into details of all his publications and research activities. Today, Professor Anna is going to share his insights on the Tibet questions in China, ascendant geopolitics, how the Chinese non-interference, national humiliation and sensitivity could become the policy instruments of China by referring to the case of Tibet. Without further delay, I now pass the time to Professor Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Let me start with the presentation. Hi. Again, uh, uh, thank you to the Tokyo International University for hosting me here. And I'm assuming you can hear me and see me clearly. Yeah. Uh, so I I'll keep my talk to around 40 minutes. And then so that we have time for question and answer. Uh, and, and feel free to write your questions also in the chat because once I've done my talk and I also read, go through the questions that are there in the chat uh, for the uh, for the uh, Zoom. Again, uh, that, uh, yesterday or last few days, we have been reading about stories in terms of Taiwan and China, right? How China is assertive or it's not assertive. According to Chinese viewpoint, when I say Chinese, I mean Chinese state viewpoint and Chinese nationalist viewpoint, what's happening in Taiwan is reminder to Taiwan not to be too arrogant, reminder to Taiwan that ultimately Taiwan belongs to China, that's the language that's used, and reminder to Taiwan that no one will help it because ultimately it's Beijing that will decide what the fate of people in Taiwan should be broadly. That's what the message is from China. From Taiwanese perspective, again, there's no single Taiwanese perspective because we know the KMT has a different perspective compared to uh, the ruling uh, party and majority population on the island. From their perspective, they'd want some kind of dignified existence vis-a-vis -vis China. Some may want to collaborate with China, others may want to be independent of China. But at the heart of the matter lies China claiming the absolute authority, right, and then sovereignty, those of you who are student of IR would know, we are talking of concept of sovereignty. China claims sovereignty over Taiwan. From Taiwanese democratic perspective, I'm not talking of the party, I'm talking democratic. Ultimately, people should decide what they want. So self-determination. So there's a struggle between, therefore, the principle of sovereignty and principle of self-determination. Now, similar kind of struggles exist if you're focusing on China vis-a-vis -vis other people. Uyghur Muslims, Tibetan Buddhists, people in Southern Mongolia, and Hong Kong people also, right? So apart from Taiwan. So my focus today is actually on Tibet, the Tibet question. 15, 20 years ago, this was more popular subject. So a lot of people are talking of Tibet. There was a fascination with Tibet in Japan, also in the West. 
but that fascination with tibet did not always lead to a political support for tibetan movement so in my own work in my first book on tibet which was geopolitical exotica tibetan western imagination i analyzed the ways in which the exoticization of tibet so positive representation of tibet not only did not help tibetans with the china it actually harmed and hurt tibetans that's my argument that's in the book but today the focus is going to be on how there is geopolitics where china is ascendant so i'm saying ascendant i'm not saying china is assertive i'm not saying china is belligerent i'm not saying china is another normal power that's for us to discuss but saying there's a very clear mark that china is rising whether it's completely risen whether it's a absolute global power whether it's still a regional power that's debatable but there's no doubt that it's a rising power so i'm looking at a new geopolitics where you have rising china so given rising china is rising what impact does it have on the tibet question so i'll explain that to you i'll start with the quote of the dalai lama look at situations from all angles and you will become more open so usually i'll start my lectures for students on this that look what's the purpose of education why are we studying why are we studying international relations why are we studying whatever we are studying we are studying because we want to understand different perspectives we recognize that there's no single truth we recognize that there may be multiple narratives multiple interpretation of truth and hence our purpose in terms of education is to recognize what are different perspectives and then make up our own mind right that's education be open so the dalai lama's quote i'll come back to that right so notice also there's mercedes benz in the ad but that's different i'll come to a mercedes benz ad later right so that's me i'm more active on facebook feel free to send me friend request or follow me and also on twitter i'm quite active there so for those of you who may not know much about tibet or even china or may not be interested but you're interested in international relations so the broad theme under which i speak is around the role of narratives in international relations i'm interested in focusing on how international relations does not reflect reality international relations is about construction of that reality you see so from very start i'm making it clear that my perspective is not a typical realist or even liberal position it's more of a mix of post colonial and that's where i locate myself post colonial international relations is my area of study though of course i combine post colonial feminist post modern and even to an extent social constructionist viewpoints of ir but the idea is that it's about narrative it's the stories we tell so i'm interested in the stories we tell stories we tell about sorry apologies for the mistake spelling mistake it should be sinophobia not sinophobia stories we tell of china's rise and i'm particularly focused in the west but also i include japan in that by the way to a great extent there's a range of thinking which is about i would say sinophobia whatever china does there's a fear there's a fear of china china is going to be belligerent china is going to be arrogant china is going to be assertive and therefore it's not a normal power so there's a sinophobic element a sinophobia could be about china but sinophobia is also about chinese people and there is a racialized element to it that chinese people are all somehow prone to authoritarianism and chinese state reflects that authoritarianism and therefore we need to fear both china and chinese people that's broad sinophobia there's another strong strand i don't know about japan you can tell me later what the situation there is in the west in particular there's a strong strand of sinophilia whatever china does it's not that bad because we are worse so china might be ruthless but who are we to say look us is also ruthless chinese culture may have some aspects of racism but look we are also racist so if china commits violence it's okay but if west commits violence and i'm talking people in the west we are the bad so there's a sinophilia also that look at chinese people they're hard working look at chinese culture it's about respect and our people don't respect our people don't work hard we are lazy unlike the chinese people and that is why china is rising and we are no longer rising and therefore that sinophilia so love for chinese culture and people which is fine and it's great translates into almost an apology for chinese state that we should not criticize the chinese state because chinese state reflects chinese culture and civilization who are we in the west to make judgment about chinese communist party because that's what chinese people want right so there's sinophilia this whole discussion around 
is China normal rising power that it will rise, there'll be some conflict, but it will adjust to the international system? Or is it an assertive or revisionist power that will change the international system? These are the debates that take place. What I want to emphasize on a lot is the role of nationalism in it, particularly Chinese nationalism, and the role of what I would call national hurt. Now, I, I'm using example of Japan because I'm, I'm giving a lecture at Tokyo International University. So a lot of time, any if you're a person from Japan and you criticize China on human rights, immediate reaction would be, who are you to tell us about human rights? What did you do in 1930s? What did you do in 1940s? We'll never forget that, right? So the story of national humiliation of Chinese civilization and Chinese people in the hands of Western and Japan, Western powers in Japan, is connected to the idea of deep national hurt that Chinese civilization has, Chinese people have, right? So what is that hurt? That as Japan or Japanese people, you should not say anything to us because you have hurt us. So what should the government of China do? It should recognize that national hurt and make sure that no power can hurt China anymore. So all violence, all assertion, all arrogance, all expansionism, and all hypocrisy of Chinese government and hence Chinese state is justified on the grounds that China has been a victim and it doesn't want to be a victim. Now, I would say role of hurt, but I call it social construction of national hurt. That doesn't imply that China, what Japan did vis-a-vis -vis China was good, not at all. China was, sorry, Japan was ruthless and it has to account for it, no doubt. It doesn't imply that what Western imperialists did in China and other parts of the world was good, not at all. We need to decolonize it. I have no doubt that we need to challenge all forms of colonialism. But what I'm saying is, it's a social construct of national hurt because if you take vis-a-vis -vis Japan until 1970, so between 1949 and until early 1980s, the Chinese Communist Party and Chinese government did not talk of national humiliation all the time vis-a-vis -vis Japan. It did not. It did not in 1970s, for instance, talk of the West as the main enemy. It talked of Soviet Union as a potential enemy. So national hurt around Japan and humiliation in Japan was rejuvenated or resuscitated from 1990s onwards. So what happened in 1990s, of course, was change in geopolitics. So bear in mind, therefore, that national hurt is a weapon that's used by the Communist Party from time to time when it suits its interests. That's what I want to talk about, right? Now, of course, I'm not talking of Japan, China, and other parts. We can do that in doing question answers. I wanted to focus on a specific aspect of uh, China, which is around Tibet. Now, a lot of scholars have argued in the past, not so much now, is that one of the weak link for China, or rising China, is Tibet. So uh, even a Chinese scholar, a critical Chinese scholar, talked of uh, Tibet being the soft underbelly of the Chinese dragon. Now, I don't use the word dragon for China because the way I don't use the word elephant for India because it's odd. I mean, fine, one can use it, but this whole dragon, elephant, tiger kind of things essentially implies that somehow UK, France, and UK are, cannot be, and US cannot be associated with animals. You know, so there's almost an orientalist association of Asian powers with animals, which I find problematic. So I don't do that. But let's come back to this. So the idea is, is Tibet still a factor in the new Cold War? I put new Cold War under question mark because that's what we are likely experiencing now, whether we, particularly the West and Japan to an extent in India, whether we China. But I put question mark because we don't know where we are going. Now, with Tibet, some of you may be more aware than others, so I'll assume that you don't have much awareness, right? So for those of you who know a lot on Tibet, excuse my you know, being very simple, but I am assuming that a lot of uh, students here may not know much about Tibet. Tibet, there are different perspectives again, as you can imagine. From the Chinese government perspective, Tibet always belonged to China. So Tibet is part of China. Chinese government has done a lot for Tibetans. It has provided autonomy to Tibetans. It preserves culture in Tibet. The Dalai Lama and Tibetans in exile are, however, thankless people. They're anti-China and anti-motherland. They're in exile in India, Nepal, and other countries. And they're therefore separatists. And Chinese government, which loves Tibetan people and does everything to help Tibetans, will not allow separatist Dalai Lama to work along with hostile West, hostile India and hostile Japan and hostile other countries to weaken China. Because 
if you allow Tibetans more autonomy and if you allow Tibetan some form of semi-independence or if you have more dialogue with the Dalai Lama, it would imply China becoming weak. And if China becomes weak, what will happen? What will happen is 19th century China, which is foreign powers along with minorities in China. This is the Chinese government language. Minorities in China like Manchu, Mongols and others and Tibetans, they will they will weaken China and the foreign powers will weaken China, right? Therefore, Chinese government has strong stand very firm because if you compromise, then you become weak. So the story of national humiliation of China since 19th century is mobilized to say that vis-a-vis Tibet, we have done enough, we will not do any more. And anyone who challenges us is a separatist, extremist, and possibly terrorist. Now, what is Tibet? Tibet, according to Chinese government is a Tibet autonomous region, which is large, second to Xinjiang autonomous region, right? Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region. Uh, it's there. But if you look at historical and cultural Tibet, Tibetan regions right now within China are a significant portion of contemporary PRC. So we are talking of a significant portion of PRC right now. So first and foremost, we have to be aware that when China talks of Tibet autonomous region, this is different from cultural and ethnic and historic Tibet that Tibetans talk about, right? That's something to bear in mind. So China will, I mean, if you've been to Beijing and there's some, a place called China Tibetology Research Center, please visit it there. I mean, it will be interesting. I've visited there. So China Tibetology Research Center. Um, it's like, I mean, I find it very odd because you don't have China Shanghai Be uh, Research Center. You don't have China Beijing Research Center. You don't have China other province research center, but you have China Tibetan uh, uh, Tibet Research Center. Why? Because of course, Tibet has been made into China's Tibet. So there's almost an insecurity, and I'm seeing you the word insecurity in China where Tibet cannot be allowed to be Tibet. It has to be China's Tibet. So that's why I word put China's Tibet. China's Tibet is not Tibetan Tibet, it's China's Tibet. China is very sensitive about it. And when I say China, remember I'm talking Chinese government. I do not equate Chinese government with Chinese people. Though Chinese government will say it represents all 1.3 billion population. One has to wonder why a country that's so powerful, that's the largest country in the world in terms of population, that's going to be largest economy very soon, that's largest in so many ways, right? China is very powerful. Why is China so insecure about few million Tibetans, right? When it controls absolutely, so hypersensitivity. Why is it so insecure with the Dalai Lama, an 80 plus elderly uh, leader in exile? Why does it care? Is it about resource and exploitation? I put the word no, but of course it is because Tibet is rich in minerals. Tibet is the land from which major rivers of Asia come. Right? So resource and exploitation there, but that's not the main factor for China. Is it strategic location vulnerability? But Tibet is huge. It's next to border, uh, to India and India is a potential challenger to China with we being a global power. I say yes to an extent. I would argue that it is very much about legitimacy of the regime. The reason why Chinese Communist Party does not want to compromise in at all on Tibet. And when I talk of compromise, I'm not talking of independence, by the way. I'm talking of what Dalai Lama calls genuine autonomy. So basically, China provides what it claims it provides, but provides properly, right? So it doesn't. It's to do with legitimacy of the regime. So what the Communist Party has done, and I'm looking at the back because I've got all these magazines here. These are called China's Tibet magazines, right? Uh, so all these magazines, I mean, these are magazines, of course, these propaganda, as you can imagine. China's Tibet, according to Chinese government, is a happy Tibet. China liberated Tibet. Right? So China has liberated Tibet since 1951, but till 1959. 51 is when China occupied Tibet. 59, between 59, 50, 1951 to 59, the Dalai Lama was still in uh, Tibet, and there was a coexistence between traditional Tibetan state, of which Dalai Lama was the head, and Chinese government. Chinese Communist Party said, we will not change the system without your consent. So we'll compromise. But in 19, by 1950, there was a popular revolt. The Dalai Lama fled, it came into exile, and then the old system was abolished. And China called, We have liberated Tibet. Now, as an aside, think of liberation. Liberation is good, right? We, will, we want to liberate. But liberation is also the language of colonialism. 
So when the British went to India, they said we are liberating natives from uh, ruthless native uh, native rulers. We are liberating native people from native rulers. When Napoleon went to Egypt, he said to people, "I am here to liberate you from your Ottoman rulers." So the fact that the word is liberation does not imply its emancipation. Does not imply its freedom. Liberation is often also the language used by the uh, occupiers. Right. In case of China, it says we liberated Tibet. Now, because the government Communist Party has said again and again, we have liberated Tibet, we have helped Tibetans. Now, for the government to say, okay, what we did in Tibet is not that good, we need to compromise. Would see that actually what the story, the narrative is, government was saying to its own population was a false narrative, and they'll not compromise on that because ultimately, Communist Party, despite all its strengths, and you know how strong it is. And how it controls China is still deeply insecure. And I would put forward the argument that the reason it's insecure is because it knows that People's Republic is Party's Republic. The PRC, I would call, is Party's Republic of China. China is not Chinese people. China is Party. The, everyone is con- uh, secondary to the Party, right? And why? So because what has happened since 1950s in particular is that China PRC combines, in my view. The worst of two ideologies. It combines the political authoritarianism of communism along with economic greed of capitalism. I wish there was some system where they could combine the political equality officially, not uh, in practice, official equality of communism with the political freedom that often capitalist systems afford. Not always, uh, capitalism can afford. So in case of China, because the Chinese regime now is a communist party, which is not communist in any way, in Marxist or Leninist sense, that right, communist party is using nationalism to bolster its legitimacy and development. But everyone knows that development cannot go forever, right? You saw Japan. Japan was seen as the major rising power in 1980s.、Uh, Paul Kennedy and other scholars in the West were talking of Japan as the next big thing, and no one talks of Japan anymore as the next big thing. What happened? We know what happened because economic growth of certain level cannot be sustained forever, right? That's how it is anywhere in the world. So, in case of China, of course, even Communist Party would be aware of what happens elsewhere. It's a very smart party. That's why it's ruling there. For them, the leg- core legitimacy does not come from development, which is not development, but is economic growth, which is benefiting some more than the others. It is essentially nationalism. So, at the heart of China's Tibet project lies the core idea of Chinese nationalism, which is then based on the idea of hurt sentiments, hurt sensibilities. We have been hurt in the past, and we are no longer going to be hurt. If you do something in Taiwan, we are going to challenge you because we do not want to be hurt anymore. So, history is a weapon. Hurt sentiments are weapon because that's the nationalist narrative in China. By the way, I hope I'm making sense.、Uh, Hakim, could you say that、uh, is my pace okay, or should I slow down? No, it's okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay.、Uh, so what I would say is that China. When I say China, remember Chinese state. China paranoia stems from the nature of the state and historical experience. And I'll explain what that historical experience is more than that. And I'll explain what the nature of the state is. I would argue that, and this is in the paper I've written, which Hakim mentioned, and I'll send you the link later in the chat. I have written a paper about colonialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, of course, there's a very typical play because, of course, there's always socialism with Chinese characteristics, capitalism with Chinese characteristics. So I've used that and played along with them. Say colonialism, Chinese characteristics. Because what I would argue is, Chinese state today is a colonialist state. Now, that does not imply that China state else in the past was not colonialist. Of course, Qing Empire was also colonialist to an extent, but not the same. So when I say Chinese state today is a Colonialist state. I mean, it's a colonialist in modern European sense. China today, therefore, more European than Europeans. China today is not like Qing Empire. Of course, remember Qing Empire also was expansionary. It occupied places.、Um, you know, in the past, Chinese Empire were also imperial states. But the difference was Qing Empire was one where different ethnic groups, what's called ethnic. Remember, they were not ethnic groups in the past. Ethnic groups like Manchu. The Manchus could rule China. Uh, the Mongols could rule China. Today, it's impossible to imagine people who are now seen as not Han can rule China anymore. In the past, 
empires that could be quite flexible. So for instance, Tibet, when it was controlled by Qing Empire, never had a Han Amban, Han representative in Lhasa. It was always a Mongol or Manchu, right? And who, who happened to be mostly Buddhists. Now today, what we find, of course, is that the space, whatever autonomy, whatever ex freedom, whatever separate identity Tibetans or Uyghurs may have is shrinking again and again. So this is why I said it. Chinese state today is more European and colonialist than many other states in the world. So when I say Chinese state today is colonial, I don't mean it's colonial in Qing Empire sense, I mean it's colonial in the European sense. When I say Chinese state today is colonial, it doesn't imply China is the only colon colonizing state. In fact, I have argued in my work that India is also a colonizing state. So if you ask people in Kashmir, India is a colonizing state. If you ask people, in Kurdish people in Turkey, they call Turkey the colonizing state. If you ask people in Balochistan, Baloch people in Pakistan, they will call Pakistan a colonial state. So China again is not uniquely colonial. It's however colonial. Now you may think, fine, what's gained by calling it colonial? What's gained by calling it colonial, according to me, is that it reflects the reality. And what's original? You'd hardly find people talking of China as a col colonial state. You may talk here China as aggressive state, China as neo-colonial in Africa, neo-colonial possibly through Belt and Road Initiative, you know, one Belt, one Road Initiative, but not colonizing. I say it's a colonial governing the Chinese characteristics. And I'm giving example of Tibet, where we can do that same with the Uyghurs also, increasingly Hong Kong. Now, according to China, it's liberation. According to Tibetans, it's an occupation. So what I've argued in my work is that China fetishizes sovereign statehood, that we are sovereign, don't interfere. It's our sovereignty, you know, that's what the language they use. And that obsession with a particular notion of state sovereignty, which I assume as scholars, students of IR, you'd be studying, that notion of sovereign statehood is connected to the historical experience of being humiliated. Remember, that's what they talk of, right? Now think of it. Are people in China today, did they know what happened 100 years ago? They didn't. They were not humiliated, but they feel humiliated because, of course, the history they learn is history that's taught by the, by the Communist Party. And that's in every country, right? History is always in the service of the nation. So we, that's what we have to remember. And why do I call it colonialism? So those of you who would have studied colonialism would know that colonialism is about a process. It's about asymmetric relation of power, that one people have superiority over the other people. It's about territorial control, control over body. It's about knowledge production. Those of you, if you haven't studied Edward Syed, please do read post-colonial theory, Edward Syed. You know that it's about knowledge production. It's not only that I control you, I also control the knowledge that's around you. Right? So if I want, imagine, I am somehow a ruler and I'm a colonizing power and I want to control Japan. So one way to control Japan is I occupy it, I defeat it militarily, I occupy it. I, the government there is now my government, I control the government, so that's territorial control, control of population. I also control knowledge production about Japan. So I would say Japanese people are backward people. Japanese people don't know how to govern themselves. Japanese people are not modern. So what do I do? I as a colonizing power will modernize them. And I will start producing knowledge about Japan, right? That's how it happens. It's about economic exploitation, cultural subservience, all these things and militarization and violence. At the heart of empire and imperialism and colonialism lies both violence and knowledge production. So those two things you have to bear in mind, knowledge production and violence. So what happens in Tibet vis-a-vis -vis China? In case of China, the fundamental reason why it's a colonizing power, China is a colonizing power, is because Tibetans do not get to decide whether they want to be independent, autonomous, or complete part of China. They never get to decide. It is the Chinese government, in this case, Communist Party, that decides for them. And that, for me, is a fundamental aspect of colonization. Second, it, remember, it's asymmetry of power. So Chinese government will talk of ownership of Tibet. So imagine you're talking of ownership of people, but that's the language, right? ownership. It is about liberating Tibet. It's about saying that, oh, we have emancipated the serfs, the, old, you know, the, uh, the people who are suffering from feudalism in Tibet. As an aside, note this. China, and this is a contradiction, and, and there's no resolution to that contradiction. And this is a paper I'm supposed to have written uh, 10 years ago. I've not written it yet, but I will write it one day on China's public diplomacy and Tibet. There's a contradiction. So China will say, when I say Chinese government will say, Tibet always belonged to us. Tibet is part of motherland. 
but everything wrong in tibet is result of old tibet under the dalai lamas now and we have liberated tibet so the question is if tibet was always part of china who did china liberate tibet from cuz you can't say that you know you, be- I, you belong to me but everything you do is someone else's fault because if you belong to me then it's my fault isn't it but that's a contradiction chinese system and diplomacy cannot resolve because at the heart of that contradiction lies the fundamental fact that tibet was not china now the fact that all foreign governments including uk japan and others recognize chinese sovereignty over tibet does not change the fact that it's colonial according to me as a scholar and hopefully for you as students and scholars is because for me whether sovereignty is there or not should not be decided by states it should be decided by people so for me at the heart of the principle of sovereignty lies the heart of consent popular will self determination now that's not international law i understand to a great extent right? you can discuss that or we can debate about that but in practice but i would still argue that we have to recognize that when we have two different perspectives perspective the powerful perspective the weak we can't say both perspectives are equally valid for me the perspective of the weak and the marginalized and the oppressed is more important when it's about them than the perspective of the powerful let me give you an example of uh, gender based relation gender violence in family let's say in a heterosexual family and you know in japan also you've got all kinds of challenges around misogyny when you know people would say oh you know women are supposed to be soft women are supposed to behave in this manner we know misogyny in the case everywhere they were not in japan uk india china everywhere this is a case of domestic violence a husband beats wife his wife right now so husband is violent and wife gets beaten up and wife complains about domestic violence will we say in fairness that oh this is husband's perspective who beats and this is wife's perspective who gets beaten as equal i would argue that ethical scholarship demand that no we view we we prioritize the view of the victim in this case the wife rather than that of the husband right because we have to recognize that humanity is based essentially if you want to for the progressive scholarship it has to be based on the views primarily of the victim rather than the victimizer so going back to that analogy using that analogy of um, and talking of china and tibet for me we have to look at tibetan perspective and prioritize that over chinese perspective and yet when we look at chinese perspective it is about asymmetric power they say we have liberated tibet if tibetans don't like that liberation too bad they can go into prison they can go into jail but we we have liberated you have to be happy all the time it's about territorial control political control i mean the le- the image on the left is what i had taken years ago when i was allowed into tibet i haven't been there for many years i hope i can go but i don't think i can go i'll not get visa for uh, china and even if i get visa for china somehow because i was not allowed for some time uh, i'll i unlikely i'll get permission to go to tibet with my views you can guess very easily right now the idea is tibetans are always grateful so again the magazines i have got the entire shelf almost entire shelf here i open i read those magazines it's like it's a monthly magazine pro- uh, produced by united front work department right uh, a, a, of the chinese government what they do is tibetans are always smiling tibetans are always happy and grateful to the government now i wonder so even by the way the images from earthquake earthquake happened in yushu in a particular part of uh, tibetan region and you've got tibetans smiling and thanking the government so we do know those of us who live in democracies of certain kinds we do know that this constant narrative of people being thankful to the government essentially is a sign of authoritarianism rather than anything else but that's what political control is chinese government controls bodies we know that even through self immolation tibetans the protesting through self immolation and what government did was not see what why are people immolating they curb news about it they will punish the entire village if i immolate myself in protest right my entire fa- not some fa- entire village will get punished but there's a control of bodies but this also and some of you may not be aware or most of you will not they also control manifestation they say we will know they decide what the next dalai lama is now again i can explain that maybe question answer if you want right what does manifestation mean because in uh, buddhism in tibetan buddhism there's no concept of soul it's more like manifestation so i'm using that concept so the idea is in case there are certain enlightened beings the dalai lama the panchen lamas and others who are reincarnate lamas 
So unlike us mortals, uh, ordinary beings, remember we are caught in cycle of uh, death, uh, rebirth, death, rebirth, right? But we don't know what our previous birth was because we are unenlightened. But there are certain enlightened beings who know who they were and therefore they continue. So they are like Buddha. They are called Bodhisattvas, not Buddha, but Bodhisattvas. So Dalai Lama is a Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva of compassion, Avalukiteshwara, right? He comes back. What's the idea? So this, the Dalai Lama, this Dalai Lama is a body. Once this body, okay, Dalai Lama's body is gone, that manifestation after some time comes back through another body, new body, right? That's the idea of manifestation. Now, so this Dalai Lama in a way decides where they will take rebirth, reincarnation. What Beijing has done is brought law to say, no, Dalai Lama and other Lamas can't decide where they will take rebirth. So somehow, Beijing, which is a communist government, claims the authority to transform the will of the manifestation when it's moving from this body to another body. So they are saying, no, Dalai Lama has no right not to take re reincarnation. Dalai Lama has to take re reincarnation, but we will decide. Side. It's a very odd but disturbing kind of role. But it also reminds us of how authoritarian powers work. They control this world and the other world, according to them, of course. Right? Uh, they produce knowledge about Tibet, how Tibetans are happy now, Tibet is unhappy in the past. They will talk of old Tibet and say Tibet was always part of China. Again, I can go into that in my own work. I've done that. They'll talk of old Tibet is bad, serfdom, new Tibet is happy, you know, under Chinese Communist Party rule, old Tibet is exploitative and, you know, ruthless and everything, new Tibet as development, we are building railways, we are building airports, and Tibetans are happy. Look at that, happy Tibetan, right? I don't know whether it's happy Tibetan is happy really, or he has a nice smile, but how happy he is and whether it's a pose, I mean, we know it's a pose photograph, right? Now, of course, China has brought development to, uh, in Tibet, but it's a colonial form of modernity. That's what it is. So it's a modernity, but it's a colonial form of modernity, which is based on cultural control. So again, this is an image I took, uh, both of them, China Lhasa Yogurt Festival. So this is a yogurt festival. Why not just call it Lhasa Yogurt Festival? No, China Lhasa Yogurt Festival. I mean, it's like saying Japan Tokyo Olympics. I mean, Olympics, Japan Tokyo Festival. And this, but that insecurity is very much there. It is about uh, not allowing people in Tibet to express themselves, not allowing people to, uh, to respect and worship the Dalai Lama, who, which they do. It is about destruction wherever it's required. It's about using violence. It's about surveillance all the time. You do know that you, I mean, you can't keep the Dalai Lama's picture in Tibet, right? It's always about surveillance, controlling people, controlling information. And it is about demographic transformation. So what we are witnessing in Tibet is now a settler of colonialism. So settler colonialism, there's a difference between uh, what uh, Japan was doing with Manchuria, right, in the past. So settler colonial kind of project. So basically what you do is, take example, difference between British in India and what happened in Australia. In Australia, the native population was largely exterminated and European population uh, took control of the country and became the natives, new natives. That's settler colonialism, colonialism through settlement. Now, in case of India, they didn't do extermination. So that's colonialism. So in case of Tibet, we find colonialism, but also settler forms. So you've got massive demographic transformation taking place in, uh, in Tibet, right? And at the heart of all of this is violence. And if you think, but you know, we don't see everyday violence in Lhasa. If you have been to Lhasa, you may think, but I don't see police everywhere, surveillance everywhere, you know, all of that. The fact of the matter, there's a difference. You know, we have surveillance in, I don't know, Japan, but we have, I think London is a surveillance capital possibly, or it used to be capital. We have cameras everywhere. But, and uh, again, I know uh, I, I have to be very polite, but let me say this. Here, wherever I could say, this government is rubbish. Boris Johnson is useless, Prime Minister is useless person. The Queen is parasitic. No point having Queen, right? I'm saying as a scholar. I do not fear that I'll lose my job over it. I can do it. That's dem democratic freedom. Of course, countries have, been, out of respect, I may not say, but I can say it. So even the surveillance camera is there, the police cannot just stop me. I mean, they can sometimes and whatever. They can be ruthless, but they can't easily stop me. I can go to the court. In case of China, you can't take the government to the court. You cannot take Communist Party to the court. There's no way in which you can do it. So what I'm saying is, while technologies might be similar in different parts of the world, including in China, the use of that technology, the misuse of the technology, and the absolute control of the technology that's there in China may only be 
sort of uh, competed vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, right? So that's something we have to bear in mind. So someone would argue that who are we to criticize China for surveillance state, given that we also surveillance state in J US, Japan, uh, and elsewhere? Please, there's a difference. The difference still is, at least here, there's some way in which we can take the government to the court to an extent. It's being eroded, I know, but we can do that. In case of China, you can't even do that. Something similar to the Uyghurs. I'll not explain that because I know I, I said I'll do it in 40 minutes. I'll take maybe 10 more minutes and I'll end with that. Uyghurs. Again, maybe we can expand. With Uyghurs also, it's a more form. It's even more draconian, more use of violence. So the image on the right is a propaganda image from China, which is of good Uyghurs and bad Uyghurs. So who are the good Uyghur Muslims? The ones who are colorful. And the bad Uyghur Muslim is a woman who in a complete in a, a hijab and niqab, right? Why is she bad? Because she's dressed like this, she's very religious, and she's supporting terrorists. Because there's another image where she's sending some information to another man who has beard. Good Uyghur, bad Uyghur. And what do you do with bad Uyghurs? You put them in prison. What do you do with Uyghurs who are right now bad but may turn out to be good? You put them in concentration camps. You make them work. You re-educate them, right? So in China, you have the whole concept of patriotic re-education and work camp. Now, of course, what Chinese government does now is it doesn't deny the camps in Xinjiang, East Turkestan, right? They say this their camp, but these are work camps. This is training camp. We're training them how to be good citizens. By the way, those of you who have studied Holocaust or know a bit about the genocide against Jewish people and others also, but Jewish people primarily in Europe uh, by Nazi Germany, Nazis did not call death camps death camps. They called death camps work camps. So Auschwitz, one of the largest uh, death camps, extermination camps, concentration camps, ha had uh, the word in German, work shall set you free. The, the reason I'm highlighting that is just because the government says a work camp doesn't imply it's a work camp. So I'm not saying that China is committing genocide so far, but China has created a mechanism through which it can concentrate Uyghur population to that extent that if it suits the interest, it can commit genocide. So it has a technology, it has a will, it has the ideology, right? So the fact that it hasn't committed full-fledged genocide right now should not make us relax that it may not do so in the future, right? Coming in. Yes. So how does China get away with it? It gets away with it by being, being colonial, by masking that colonialism and promoting nationalism. It's all about nationalism, 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 right? And nationalism is what that explains that what's in, what, what we may say, I don't use the word internal colonialism, by the way, because for me, internal colonialism is assuming the legitimacy of Chinese state to vis-a-vis Tibetans and Uyghurs, and I don't accept that legitimacy. For me, it's Tibetans and Uyghurs who should decide uh, who should rule them. But still, what, I mean, what makes us confident, if you are confident about that, China can be assertive within its territories, it can be colonial there, but it's okay, so long as it's not colonial outside. Right? Because nationalism that's based on that hurt is, remember, there are two aspects of national hurt, national humiliation. One, internal enemies, those who weaken China, those who ask for many rights, those who create disunity, those who are often minorities, but also Han Chinese, who are asking too many questions and don't respect authority, right? So there's that internal enemy. So colonization within, authoritarian within is justified in order to prevent disunity within. That's nationalism. But remember, the other aspect of that nationalism is the external part. Who are the enemies? Japan, the West, anyone who opposes us. Soviet Union at one point in time. It could be India, it could be anyone else, right? So internal. So a nationalism that based on national humiliation, story of national humiliation, story of national hurt, that had internal and external has aspect to them, to it, we cannot expect that nationalism to remain colonizing only within because it will also become assertive and colonizing outside. And that's what's happening now. What it leads to, of course, is Tibetans and Uyghurs being largely disappeared from political discourse. Hong Kong, we saw that whatever limited democracy they had is gone. Taiwan will be the next one if it can get away with it. What about Asian neighbors? Of course, China can't do that with Japan easily so far. China can't do that with India easily. Can it do that with the Pakistan, which is an ally, Nepal and the places? Of course, it uses one belt, one road, BRI and all of that to create neo-colonial structures. Now, difference between colonization, neo-colonialism, neo -colonialism, which West has practiced in Africa and China practices in Africa, India practices in Africa, and to an extent, Japan does to an extent, but not that much because Japan is not in 
directly involved with political mechanism. But what neoliberalism essentially implies is use of economic dominance for political gains. So what happens is once China gives you so much of loan, then you're in debt with China. Then if China says to you, curb your vigor, do not allow Tibetan courage, support us in the United Nations, you will start doing that. That's neocolonialism. So this is what it's important to bear in mind that the fact that China was a victim of colonization in the past does not imply it gets a free pass or it should get a free pass with its, with, with its own colonial and neocolonial practices. Right? In case of that, India, I'm not going to it. Vis-a-vis -vis India, India is seen, Japan, of course, is the, one of the main threats and challenge for China in the region. But India is another one because Japan is seen as a declining power, though it's immensely powerful, it's seen as a declining power. But India is seen as a bigger problem by, by China in longer term because of its own population and growth and everything. Vis-a-vis -vis India, the reality is they have a border dispute. They have Dalai Lama living there. But something I, I'll, I'll leave that with you. I'll not explain that. Is remember, China and India in 1954 has signed an agreement called Panchal Agreement. You know, we both will work together. But what most scholars ignore and forget is that agreement was called Agreement between PRC and India on trade and intercourse between Tibet region of China and India. So Tibet was there. Now it's a Tibet region of China. So Ch Tibet is now recognized as region of China, but still see, it's the last international treaty where Tibet existed. What does it tell you? It tells you that both China and India agreed to disappear the Tibet region through that treaty. And India hoped that by compromising on Tibet, it will have good relation with China. It didn't happen. You had a border dispute and then border war in 1960. The Lama fled in 1959 and you had border war in 1962. Uh, and now, of course, it goes up and down in recent years, particularly not in this region, Northeast, but this will be the main flashpoint. In Ladakh, to the other side, you've got China and India both militarizing the region. And I'm someone, by the way, who's very critical of India also. I, I, I guess, but I'm very critical of India. I've argued that on border dispute, India was significant in being belligerent without having the capacity to do so. But when you look at what's happening in Ladakh, you could see that it is a result of essentially China not only militarizing heavily, but also want to teach some kind of lesson to India. To say that, look, if you are too close to Japan and too close to US, or you think you will do that, you will have problems in the region. So those things are happening. This is the border dispute. Again, I've worked on that. I've written on that. You can Google my name and China and border dispute, you'll get players, right? So what happens, of course, is, and I've argued in my own work, that there's a strategic dissonance, national strategy for China, border is strategic. Tibet is nationalist, which is you don't compromise. For India, Tibet is strategic and border is nationalist. You don't compromise. So both of them can't compromise and it's unlikely they're going to compromise. But we also know the region is important for Asia and the world because of the environment, for the waters that come from there. We are aware vis-a-vis -vis India and China. India is deeply insecure because the major rivers in India come via Tibet, which China controls. India is also insecure because as China through BRI and through you know, Maritime Silk Route, what it calls Maritime Silk Route, but it trade and everything and its bases in different parts, India fears being encircled the way China we fear being encircled through Quad and other things. Of course, you have India-Pakistan tensions. I'm not going to do detail there. India-Pakistan tension, which of course is related to China-Pakistan working close and then tension in Kashmir. So we are talking of world's two largest states, not only in competition, but with serious conflicts, with no resolution of that conflict in the coming years, right? And of course, that then leads to other kinds of things, why that relations like to get more heated. And Tibet is not the only factor, but a fundamental factor. And that's what you have to bear in mind. From In terms of Chinese government's perception of India, it used to see India as a weak, then India as an upstart, then India as a potential problem because it hosts the Dalai Lama. Then India is also someone who's hostile because working closely with Japan. It has worked closely with Japan, closely with Vietnam, closely with US, and possibly Australia and other countries, right? So all these quad business, which I guess other, you'd have guessed, guessed lectures on quad and other things, to bear in mind that quad is, it's not a real military, it's not a military alliance. It's essentially an expression of interest by powers who may not mention China, but we all know what it's all about. But China is not a passive power here because Quad is in, in a way a response to what China is already doing in the region, which is asserting itself. Right. So what I'd like to conclude with is 
that when we talk of Tibet question, you know, Tibet question is important for China. If we take Chinese claims over Tibet as given and we can't do anything about it, and we say, fine, China is colonizing in, within China, what it calls China, and China is colonizing and colonizing Tibetan people, Uyghur people, fine, that's not our business, it's internal affairs. We are underplaying the fact that a, colon, a power that's colonizing its own territory, according to that government, is also going to be a bully in its neighborhood and also potential neocolonial power in other parts of the world. So I would say that China's assertiveness also is connected to China's colonizing internally. China's, and that's because Chinese nationals are both based on the internal and the external aspects of enemies, right? So therefore it's quite important we recognize that what's happening with the Tibetans and Uyghurs is also connected to what's happening with the China versus Japan, China and Hong Kong, China versus uh, Taiwan, China versus US, China versus India, that's the connection. Now, how should we study China? That's, and I'll take three minutes on that, possibly Hakim, and then I'll end with that. We need to go beyond Sinophobia and Sinophilia. Now, one could say that, look, I'm criticizing China all the time, but I'm criticizing China by saying that there's a difference in China, Chinese state and Chinese people. It's very important that we distinguish. We don't adopt a racialist and racist view to say, oh, this is what Chinese people want. We need to recognize that there's a lot of pressure and influence on scholarship. Again, I don't know about Japan. You can, I want to know more about Japan, what's there. But in the West, there's a lot of pressure on scholarship around China here. There's that criticism of China, but there's also love of China. But there's also this whole idea that let's be careful about China. Why should we be careful about China? Because Chinese people's sentiment might be hurt. What I call weaponization of sensitivity. Uh, where do Tibetan Uyghurs fit in? We have to understand, do we see them as minorities in China? Remember, for Tibetans and Uyghurs, they're not minorities. They're people living in their own homeland, homeland that is occupied by China. But fine, is it, man? is it internal colonialism? But essentially for me, and as a, as a post-colonial scholar, I argue that we need to challenge what we call normin, normative nation statism. We can't take nation statism for granted. We need to acknowledge that contemporary nation states are product of colonizations. And these contemporary nation states are also practitioners of colonization. Right. So we, what I would call is the kind of discussion we are having in the UK, US, decolonize it, decolonize education, decolonize theory, decolonize international relations. Right. It's our, that's what I would ask for. So if we decolonize the international relations, we need to acknowledge China not as a victim of colonization, but as a practitioner of it. Right. Uh, it's not easy to do what you do. That's my book. The first one, Geopolitical Exotica. The second was on India and Islamophobia there. My book was translated into Chinese. Uh, the scholar happened to be a party school person in Beijing, right? And you think, but how was it translated? Fine, it's a very scholarly book, right? Uh, now, it was translated, that person put a lot of effort, it took more than a year, it was going to be published, then it was never published, right? Because there was a particular word. Uh, I said that period between 1911 to 1951 was a period of de jure Chinese sovereignty de facto Tibetan independence, because Tibet was independent. They said, no, you can't use the word independence. But I said, but it was independent. No, you can't use the word independence. But I said, but that's what it was. I mean, I can't say Tibet was not independent when that's what I'm saying. So there could be no compromise and it was not published. Now, I'm just giving you an example. You'd also know that any work that's critical of China will not get published in China, right? That's it. I'm sure it gets published, by the way, for scholars and others to read, but it's not in public. Now, in case of the West, what I find is, and this is a left images, there's almost an export of China's Tibet. So what Chinese government now does is, it's not only convinces its own population that Tibet belongs to us, it also wants to convince in Japan, South Korea, convince the people in Asia, convince people in the West that, no, no, Tibet belongs to us. How does it do it? It does it through by sending scholarly delegations. Now, I have hosted scholarly delegation, by the way. I think my university would have hosted more delegations from China than on Tibet than any other university possible. You can last 10 years. So I have interacted. None of the delegations are about exchange of uh, values. I mean, again, I know I, I'm on records. So I can still say it. Can you imagine when we were hosting delegation in the past, I was asked by the embassy, which, by the way, which facilitated these things. It was embassy that approached me, can we host these things? I said, fine, I'll host it. So, you know, I'm quite transparent. The embassy approached me, I said, fine, we'll host you. They said, can we not, can we only have scholars? I said, fine, but only scholars, because I open all the events to public. 
anyone can come so long they register can we not allow tibetans to come right so imagine a discussion on tibet where i am being requested not to allow any tibetans to come i mean in any other context that's racism isn't it imagine saying that can we have a discussion on racism in the uk but not allow any black person to come can we allow a discussion on islam and everything but not allow muslims to come Dude, that's racist discriminatory can we have a discussion on gender and women but not allow women to come in? you know that's ridiculous but that was a request made by the embassy official informally to me that can we not allow tibetans to come i said no that's not possible we will allow it but of course it there will be no protest and everything and i did request tibetans who came not to uh, protest which they didn't it was a discussion heated but discussion so i uh, but what i noticed with those delegations is that it's not for scholarly exchange ever it's almost to inform us what the good position is right and that's something to bear man and now of course you can imagine there's scholars like myself who can challenge anything and many things so i've had a situation in the past where i had a chinese embassy official come to this office by the way it's a very colorful office the person came here and because i hosted the dalai lama it is okay then i hosted the uh, prime minister of government in exile dr dr lobsang so i was going to host him now in and so i was said that no, you are a friend of china we allow you access to china and allow you to access to tibet why are you hosting him i said i'm hosting him because that's i host everyone i host you also so what's wrong in it because as an academic we have to host everyone and they said that we if you ever host and invite such people in the in the future we will make an example out of you make example so that was a threat what would they do so basically they would complain to my university now my university is very good academic freedom they'll not say anything to me but they did try to raise complaint to the university now they are hoping that universities because we get students from china we have exchange research exchange and partner china that university will buckle under pressure and say please don't do anything against china right that's not really what you should do and will not do and anyway with my position and i'm very clear that if i'm ever asked by my employer right that don't criticize china i will resign that's how my position is they don't do this academic freedom right but think of it many scholars you note i don't know about japan i know in the web that many scholars no longer criticize china very openly because the fear that visa will be cancelled the fear what will happen with the visa sensitivity but the way they will justify it will that oh we are not no one says that you know i don't want i want don't want trouble with china they will say oh no of course i can criticize china but you know the students from china we have to respect their sensitivity and therefore we should not criticize them and for me that's racism that's racism because that assumes that if western students can accept criticism students from africa can accept criticism but students from china cannot accept criticism because that's a hurt sensitivity that's a weaponization hurt sensitivity we will be very careful of how scholarship in the west is being influenced and will end with this is remember that ad i showed to you i started with it think listen to all different perspectives and make up your own mind kind of thing mercedes went had to withdraw that ad and apologize for it and you know why did it because of the pressure from chinese netizens now and what the daimler own company mercedes benz said we will take steps to deepen our understanding of chinese culture and values now think of it what is it in chinese culture and values that prevents the dalai lama from being heard with dalai lama saying listen to all view points we know there's nothing in the chinese culture and values it is all in communist party's dominance but you see how western companies in this case are bending over backwards because of market so this is what's happening and i'll end with this is remember i am still hopeful hopeful that and say china is really not tibet remember in history empires collapse we saw with japanese empire collapse we saw with western empire it collapsed we saw with qing empire it collapsed there's no reason why the contemporary empire of china may not change in the future so the hope to remember is and we need to decolonize scholarship remember that in international relations we should not take things for granted and we have to acknowledge and work towards a better world where everyone is seen as equal human beings and we do not allow nationalism to justify our silence on and complicity on rights uh, abuses and uh, lack of freedom on that note alan here thank you i know i took longer than i should have taken but you know hopefully we'll have time for question after thank you so much professor anna uh, thanks for insight and i really hope that you can sometime in the coming future you can go back to china to do the field work and i really agree with you that we just try to present some facts and you know from our own argument 
we hope that we can do research freely. So um, I now see we have many questions from the four at least five. And um, but sorry, can I ask you the uh, first questions before I open the floor uh, to others? I am, you know, uh, kind of very interested about the Dalai Lama. So let's say, um, but this is uh, the fact that Dalai Lama, he already mentioned that after his death, there will no more Dalai Lama. So somehow he declined that there will be next one of the Chinese manifestations or reincarnations about the next Dalai Lama. And I would like to know from your perspective, what will happen next, let's say after uh, Dalai Lama passed away, uh, what would the situations be? Um, let's say the Dalai Lama in Tibet or regarding China in the relationship? Uh, thanks for that very important question. We are all talking about what next, isn't it? Because uh, it will be a crisis. It will be a crisis because you have on one hand, Chinese government that has said that Dalai Lama will have to reincarnate because that is Tibetan tradition and we will protect Tibetan tradition. So what would happen is they are likely to identify after Dalai Lama's death, possibly like, you know, after a few years, and there'll be a competition because they know that in exile also there might be a Dalai Lama possibly. So they will identify a boy, they'll get some Tibetan Lamas to say this is the Dalai Lama and then control it absolutely. But Chinese government will also know that that Dalai Lama will have no respect amongst most Tibetans. That's clear, which is okay with them. I'll tell you why it's okay with them. What would happen in exile is, now Dalai Lama said he may take reincarnation as, as a woman, he may not reincarnate, but ultimately what he's saying is he will decide, not others. And traditionally that he's right, because remember it's his manifestation. It's like, you know, it's like me deciding what to do. If he and he has made it clear that whatever happens, no, he changes, but it's certain. He says, whatever happens, I will not take reincarnation in side Chinese controlled territories so long as there's no so long as there's no compromise. And there's no compromise. Right. So there's a possibility that the senior lamas in Tibet following the tradition will identify someone in exile. So you'll end up with two Dalai Lamas, right? Now you can imagine the media circus around it international media circles. So the, there'll be Dalai Lama in exile, there'll be Dalai Lama uh, according to Chinese government in Tibet. But Chinese government will know that they have no, there's no respect for the, that Dalai Lama. That will lead to more disillusionment amongst Tibetans with the whole institution. Then it would lead to a disrespect of the Dalai Lama institution by some Tibetans because they'll not see the Chinese appointed Dalai Lama as a real one. So that serves the purpose of the Chinese government. The Chinese government doesn't really want another Dalai Lama. They want is Tibetan Buddhism to be diluted. The institution of Dalai Lama to be no longer as respected as it was it's until now. So they, that will serve their purpose. Now, however, and I don't have hope with it, by the way, but if, I'm sure they are, you know, we are talking of Chinese government, I'm sure it's a big government with all different viewpoints. And I've in, in the past interacted with officials who would be less of hardline, right? Uh, in different ways, but not now. Uh, so what I would think is they would also be, I'm sure, un, within China, within party schools, within the government, within the party, I'm sure even high level government, who would think that rather than recognize another Dalai Dal Lama in Tibet under their control, they could not recognize anyone. And then negotiate with the exiles to recognize those in exile and then have some kind of compromise. But the reality is, if you look at Chinese government position, they argue that there's a dialogue. There's no dialogue now, but in history, in the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years, they've had dialogue with the Dalai Lama for return of the Dalai Lama. But once the two Dalai Lamas, they can't negotiate with anyone in exile. So that's the permanent creation of Tibet question. So it's no longer Tibet question with question mark. It's a permanent eyesore, permanent thorn under the side of China. So we don't know what will happen, but likelihood is given how confident, arrogant Chinese government right now is. It will compete to recognize someone, uh, get its own people, you know, government to invest. And, you know, with its power, it may start getting other countries in the world, not, not all, other countries in the world to start respecting what it has chosen. But it's going to be a sad situation because it would also imply no negotiation ever between Tibetans and uh, Chinese government. 
Thank you. Um, we have roughly, you know, 30 minutes left here. So uh, let me just open the floor uh, to everyone here. So we got some questions from the chat room. Um, the first one here would be from a student, um, Maki. And uh, he mentioned that uh, the questions would be, how, Sophia, do you think China is manipulating religion for their own agenda? Because uh, the student noticed that not many communist country, the PLC would ban Christianity but allow other religion like Buddhism. So, uh, yeah, what do you think about this? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Maki, for your comment and question here. So, again, uh, unlike during Cultural Revolution, was religion was practically banned. Of course, religion is not banned anymore, right? So, 1982 Constitution allows for freedom of worship, freedom of religion, but it doesn't allow that for the members of Communist Party, which implies that it doesn't allow that for a large section of population. So you're right. So what Chinese, if you look at last 30 years, what they have done is in 80s, they allowed religion to come back. But then what happened also was growing assertion of religious identity, cultural assertion, and then 1989, Tiananmen Square uh, protests and then massacre happened. Since 1989, China has again restricted almost all aspects of life. So 1980s is an exceptional period where religious groups are allowed to flourish and then there was a crackdown since 1989 and there's a management of it. It's all about management. So you're right. So Buddhism, the two, uh, two, three, well, two, three relig religious identities or religions that Chinese government is most skeptical of or most anxious of. It's not entire Christianity. It is Roman Catholicism. So for instance, if you look at China and different parts of China, in general, different strands of Protestant Christianity are spreading but not Roman Catholicism. The reason for that is because in case of Roman Catholicism, the Pope is in Vatican. So the absolute authority or the supreme leader, you know, the main figure of Roman Catholicism is in, not in China. So Chinese government doesn't control him. So they're very skeptical of Roman Catholicism. But we know that in recent years, uh, you'd have bishops recognized by Vatican who are underground and their bishops recognized by Beijing, Right, those countries take place. And in recent years, the Pope and you know the Vatican have been quiet on China because they want are working closely with the Chinese government to come to some compromise. But the anxiety of China with the fact that is it doesn't control the leader of that religion. Buddhism is something that they have allowed, they have allowed it to continue. But that Buddhism it becomes political and politicized, then they don't like it, right? So on that. The main form of Tibetan Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism has been quite popular amongst Han Chinese, like it has been popular among people in Hong, Hong Kong, Taiwan, but also in China. But, and this is a big important but, the moment a Lama, a senior Lama, is seen as asserting, a talking about Tibetans, they get sidelined, marginalized, tax rates, or whatever, right? So that's what's happening. So, and reason why Tibetan Buddhism is tolerated, supported partly, but also curbed is because, of course, the supreme leader of Tibetan Buddhism with all different sects. By the way, Tibetan Buddhism, as you may know, has different sects, but all religions have different. There's nothing surprising there. But no one can deny that Dalai Lama is the most respected figure amongst all sects of Tibetan Buddhism. He may not be the leader, but he's respected. And what Chinese government wants is a disrespect of him, right? So in this case, because the Dalai Lama is in exile, they're skeptical of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Now, Islam. Islam is something that they allow for Hui Muslims, but Uyghur Muslims, they're skeptical because partly there's no leadership at best because there's an ethnic dimension. So what I would say, in, I would summarize the, my answer in response to your question, Maki, would be that they use religion to some extent, but on, only so long as they can manage that religion. The moment that religious identity can lead to asserting people in any way politically, not against China, but politically, there'll be a crackdown on it. And that's what we're witnessing in different parts of China. Thank you. Our next questions would be from a participant. Um, the question is that, do you think China's success in combating coronavirus will affect its perceived legitimacy in terms of its expansions, consolidations of territory, especially compared to US, UK, and India? COVID virus, you mean? Uh, coronavirus, yeah. 
Corona virus, yeah, yeah, uh, corona virus. Yeah, uh, see, this is how I find the whole, I mean, one can look at corona virus and how it happened. Remember when it started, the whole idea was China, that fall, China, it's happening in China, you know, China, it started with China and we were talking of China as a problem. Then of course, China managed to control it, like unlike many countries, like including my country, the UK, we have, it has been horrible how we have dealt with this here. But what I would say is, I, I mean, I wouldn't say success because Chinese model, remember, there's a lot of talk of Chinese model, how China managed to control. Take example, Japan, you have got, you also had rise and then fall. Japan did not follow the draconian measures of China in curbing coronavirus. But when you look at death rate, it's not similarly high. So one could say, but why is the death rate so high in Western countries like US, UK? Now, is it because of aging population? But Japan has even more aging population than the UK. Now, so the other aspect, what about Taiwan? Taiwan was successful to a great extent. New Zealand to a great extent was successful. So we have to bear in mind that the countries in the world, and I'll include Japan as part of it, but also essentially Taiwan, uh, New Zealand, that managed to deal with coronavirus much better than even China. Now, coming back to China, China's success, China has been quite good at, I would say, let's say, creating the problem, then solving it, and then selling its draconian measures of solving the problem as a model for the rest of the world. So coronavirus is one of them. So I'm not, look, I'm not saying that China created it consciously. Who knows what has happened, right? But clearly it started from China. It became bad. And there was a curbing of uh, uh, travels inside but not outside and all of that, right? And we know that in the first uh, one to two months, a lot of things were hidden around coronavirus. We know that, right, in Wuhan in particular. So what I would say is that you're right. Chinese success or perceived success in controlling coronavirus relative to some, some major democratic countries. Because China will not talk of Japan, by the way, and Japan's success. China will not talk of Taiwan. China will not talk of New Zealand. It will talk of US and UK. It's easy, right? It will not talk of Indonesia. It may talk of India because it suits. But China's perceived success with some large democratic countries will be used as a model, a template that, look, if you want to curb coronavirus, if you want to curb, just have 100% information on all your citizens and control them whenever you can. So yeah, you're right. In fact, this is something I wanted to write and never ended up writing. It is that how sadly coronavirus and responses to it is going to lead to more authoritarian forms of control rather than more democratic forms of control. Thank you. Um, sorry, I have to give the time to a participant who raised the hand first, and then I will come back to the questions uh, from the chat room. Um, Namo Chodan, uh, you can now speak. Peace. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Namo. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, sir, for your um, wonderful lecture. And um, being a Tibetan myself, I was really uh, touched upon people um, and also on top of that scholars speaking about Tibet. So um, I have a question like um, the Dalai Lama has uh, proposed, uh, proposed a, um, a middle, proposed a suggestion like uh, the middle way approach where um, we Tibetans don't seek independence anymore. And um, it is just like the one country, two system kind of policy. And uh, do you think this kind of system would work? In the uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are you finish? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lamu, for that question. So, for those who may not know, right? So, Chinese government says Tibet belongs to us no more, nothing else. Then there are Tibetans, and it it also covers one of the questions there in the chat, which is about Tibet independence. What do Tibetans want, right? So, there are Tibetans. I mean. There's no survey and we can't have survey, we know it, right? But the Tibetans who want his independence the way Tibet was historically independent. Then there are Tibetans, some who work with the Chinese government. But then many Tibetans, and we can safely assume that the majority are those who go with what the Dalai Lama is saying. So the Dalai Lama said, we want genuine autonomy. That's the middle way, right? Middle path. And he combines that middle way with the middle path and of uh, Buddhism. So the idea is you don't take one extreme, which is independence, which is what historically Tibet was, and you don't take the other extreme, which is complete assimilation by China, and you go with middle path because that way China will be happy and Tibetans will be happy. The problem is 
how do you do it? Okay, when the Chinese government says, we are not going to provide you that autonomy because according to Chinese government, genuine autonomy is disguised independence. So if you're asking for genuine autonomy, you're actually asking for independence. Now, how can anyone convince this government which doesn't want to compromise that no, actually genuine autonomy means genuine autonomy, nothing else. <clears throat> In theory, it should be easy because Chinese government in any case controls everything, right? It has absolute control. Even if it gave genuine autonomy, it could curb genuine autonomy in case it felt that it was leading to independence. But they will not allow it because I said, it's connected to the nature of the state in China. This is connected to the colonizing nature of state. It's not going to change. Now, in terms of uh, one country, two system kind of thing that was being proposed in 1990s is what Hong Kong has. I mean, look, Lamu, I mean, we don't need to even go where what that one country, two system has led to in case of Hong Kong. If it can happen to Hong Kong, which is economically so strong, if it could happen to Hong Kong, which, where there was so much of international presence, that's not a possibility in Tibet. And one final thing, I know that Tibetan exile government, they were talking of one country, two system. They don't do that anymore. One country, two system. From the Chinese Communist Party perspective, that was never a possibility because they had liberated Tibet. They still had to liberate Hong Kong. So Hong Kong in the communist imagination was more backward than Tibet. Tibet is already part of motherland and hence liberated equal. Hong Kong is backward because it was occupied by British colonizers. And therefore, we need one country, two system for some time to allow people of Hong Kong to then be open-minded to become part of motherland. So see, the logic there was opposite. That one country, two system is a temporary measure. And what, of course, has happened, it was less even more temporary than what it was supposed to be. So I don't see one country, two system as a solution until and unless there's a change of heart, which I'd be surprised if it happened, in Beijing, where there's a recognition in Beijing that what will make China stronger long-term is not by bullying its neighbors, not by completely taking away rights of its own population, including populations that are resisting it, but what will help China is being more democratic. That would help, right? Uh, so, and then one final thing on this. What do Tibetans want? You know, Lamo is, well, Lamo, I'm with you, you're a Tibetan here. Thank you for the speaking out here. One could say, no one knows. But for me, there's a simple answer. Do we want to know what Tibetans want? Chinese government should allow a proper open Tibet where people can be asked, what do you really want? You know, that will never be allowed. So in the absence of voices from Tibet who can speak out, we have to safely assume while it's a range, many of them would want not what they're getting right now. Because absolute control is sign not of development. Absolute control is sign of insecurity. Things that are taking place is not right. Thank you, Professor Anna. Um, we have Professor Su Jin Sin. Uh, she's specialized in South Asian studies. So she also has a questions for you. Uh, Professor Sin, please. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Anand, for a very interesting talk. I really enjoyed. Um, I have a question about how South Asian neighbors have seen the Tibet problem, uh, especially domestic violence in your analogical term. Uh, India, Nepal, and Bhutan, uh, they are sharing the long borders with Tibet. And they have shown very generous attitude to Dalai Lama and Tibetan refugees. So how do you see such a generous approach from the neighboring countries affect China's attitude to Tibet? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Very important question. And I won't be able to answer it fully, but let me give some answers to it, right? Again, for those who don't know, it, and this is again another, another hypocrisy in Chinese foreign policy. Chinese foreign policy, like Indian foreign policy, is based on the principle of non-interference, right? Respect our sovereignty, we do not interfere in internal affairs, right? That's what they say. And you think that China is different from US because US doesn't talk of that, US interferes here, there, and everywhere. But if you look at Chinese policy in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in Maldives, in Sri Lanka, China is involved in internal politics. So China will start supporting one party against the other. They'll support party that's against India rather than party that's in favor of India. So they interfere. So that's something you have to bear in mind. Now, Nepal had a generous policy or okay policy with the Tibetan until 1970s. That's gone. By now, Nepal has a very harsh policy with the Tibetan refugees. The Tibetan refugees are 
activities are curbed, their democratic election cannot take place uh, in exile in Nepal. So what's happening, of course, is through the influence of Chinese government, Chinese investment, Chinese aid, and I'm sure Chinese embassy, there's a curbing of political activities by uh, Tibetans. Now, you could say, but political activities of Tibetan, what does it mean? The fact that Tibetans express themselves as Tibetans culturally is also political because Chinese government knows what a lot of time in Japan, in West, we don't recognize is that for Tibetan people, or for like Uyghurs also, any expression of culture is essentially political. They want to show we are not Chinese, we are Uyghur. We are not Chinese, we are Tibetan, right? So that's what's happening. But uh, vis-a-vis South Asia, not India, but other places, China does play that divide and rule game, which is what empires always did. The British did that in different parts of the world, which is that, oh, we'll support someone in Nepal, not others. If you do this, we'll support your party, we'll support your government, we'll invest more in you. Uh, we support uh, Pakistan, but not India. In Maldives, again, we know that the government change has taken place. At one time, there was a government that was allowing, supporting a lot of investment from China. Then the other government comes that is supported by India. So what India and China, I'll say both, are doing, of course, is as Japan invests uh, in a lot of places, but it is not seen as a direct challenge to China or to anyone else. Right. So Japanese investment, rightly or wrongly, Japanese international aid is seen as less political than aid by China or India. And the reason for that, of course, is because China and India both quite openly, though they will not acknowledge, will see one or the other party as pro-China or pro-India. So that's in Sri Lanka, that's in Nepal, that's in Maldives also now. I know that doesn't answer your entire question, but that's what's happening. So we're dealing with the very dynamic region is what I would say. It's much more dynamic than Europe wants. Thank you, Professor Ennard. Uh, we have questions piling up now. Um, can you be briefly answer each yeah. question? See, uh, yeah. the first one actually would be um, the student um, said that Tibet, uh, Tibetan organizations, one of the Tibetan organizations, has accused China of conducting nuclear weapons research there, to be set on a Tibetan patrol, which is known to be very fragile. And uh, the students are aware that China has been called out for the constructions of the buildings that does not allow the traditions of um, Tibet. So what measures have China taken to address these problems? And also, what's your take on this matter? Uh, again, th thanks for that very important question. There's a lot of work done on environmental destruction in Tibet. And those of us who have visited Tibet are not not the propaganda visit. By the way, I've been on propaganda visit where I see very nice, happy people, but I've also seen other parts of Tibet. You see entire mountains being destroyed. I mean, you'd see the mountain and then the next year you go, that mountain is half gone. So there's excessive mining. There's excessive uh, experimentation in terms of environment that's going on. And now what the Chinese government would say that there's mining, but we are providing jobs to Tibetans. The reality is that if you look at who are the people getting jobs, it's not Tibetans, it's not the local people, it's always almost Han or Hui Chinese from the mainland. So what's happening is the growth, the economic development, economic growth in Tibet is essentially benefiting Han and Hui population rather than Tibetan population. So economically it doesn't benefit and environmentally it is destructive. And you're right. So there's a lot of stories around what exactly is China doing in terms of militarization. So all the evidence points out, the building of airports, where you don't really have traffic. Why would you build airports if you don't have air traffic? Right? Uh, damming of rivers. Again, why so many dams when you don't really need that much of dam in the region? The damming of rivers, the building of airports, uh, the extension of railways, where the population is sparse, is very clear that it's for the dual purpose. So infrastructure being developed is for dual purpose. One purpose is, of course, controlling Tibet, right, supposedly through development, but the second is militarization to deal with India, because India is seen as a possible competitor, it is a competitor, but possible enemy in medium to long term. So all of this is taking place. We will never get 100% answers, remember, because there's no information. But again, I would say the onus is on Chinese government to deny and then allow some kind of open access for journalists to go and see whether things, uh, what the other outsiders are claiming is there or not. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from a second year student, uh, D. Um, the student asked that, what would the role, or at the same time, the Chinese, 
uh, do about the Chinese colonialist tendencies in Tibet and other regions. Uh, because from the recent incursions into Taiwan, it's clear that China is getting less and less apprehensive of hiding its intentions as in its image to the world. As someone who studied in Chinese university, the level of indoctrination about these issues would be uh, tremendous. So um, with international pressure or domestic pressure, um, they are very limited. So what kind of actions can we really take in approaching this kind of issue? Again, thank you for raising such an important question. I wish the kind of question you raised was also raised here in the UK, US, where there are so many scholars still who believe that China can be managed, controlled just by dialogue with them. Right? That's, I wish your kind of question was also here. I would say you're right. So there's no domestic pressure to curb exercise. There's no domestic pressure on Xi Jinping to moderate. Now, in terms of international pressure, China has been very good at getting many countries to side with it or dividing even European countries. So dividing Europe from US and within Europe, Italy from this, East Europe from West Europe, they do that. So for me, a way out would be not military alliances, that's not the solution. It would be a continuing dialogue with China, but also drawing lines somewhere. So for instance, if China says, do not host the Dalai Lama, Countries can say, but this is our sovereign right. We will host a religious leader. Rather than say, oh, we are not going to host the Dalai Lama because you are telling us not to. So think of yourself, right? If you hold the Dalai Lama at Tokyo International University, you know, see of your Japanese government, someone from government meets the Dalai Lama, you know the kind of pressure you are going to get. My question is, there should be democratic building of consensus in other countries like Japan, UK, India, wherever, right? To say that rather than accept what China says, we need to assert ourselves, not necessarily militarily, though militarily one should be prepared, no doubt, but we need to assert ourselves in terms of our values. So if we believe religious freedom is important, if we believe that human rights are important, then let's put that into practice and support people who are struggling for human rights in China and people who are struggling for human rights in Chinese controlled regions outside. So not accept Chinese government narrative, but support those who challenge government narrative also. Thank you. We have uh, a lot of questions <laughs> from the floor. Uh, I try to group three questions into one. They are about the ethic issues here. Um, so this is about do people in Tibet see themselves as Chinese? Or do many of them support separatist idea uh, as championed by the Dalai Lama or uh, they think differently? And um, the second one actually would be about the Han Chinese people. It seems like they're now increasing in Tibet for the Han Chinese people. Um, so would that be some sort of, um, let's say, harming the Tibetan culture and traditions? Uh, the first one actually would also be about the ethnic issues. It's about the uh, Uyghur Muslim, and seems like they're sent to camp for just because of different culture here. So the questions would be, the Chinese uh, Christians, Hindus, and people of their other religions actually would face the same problem in the near future. So we have three questions from that perspective. Yeah, and as, again, uh, thank you for all these questions. I may not be able to answer all of them comprehensively. So I'll take pick some of them, right? So in this case, one, again, look, uh, in fact, I would say Dalai Lama is not a separatist. In fact, Dalai Lama is working towards a stronger, more coherent China along with Tibet, right? So his genuine autonomy is not a separatist ideology. That's, separatist is the language used by Chinese government against the Tibetan. As I said, we don't know what Tibetans want because we are never allowed to find what Tibetans want. But the fact that Chinese government doesn't allow anyone to find what Tibetans want, there's no way in which Tibetans can express themselves, right? There's no vote, there's no referendum. They can't speak freely or even half freely to anyone. Tells you that essentially China is afraid of Tibetan people expressing themselves. And my, as a scholar, then we have to say, okay, given that Chinese government doesn't allow them to express, what does it mean? It essentially implies that the lack of legitimacy, which implies that many people possibly do not want to be part of China, but we would not know. But remember, Chinese government does the same thing with Chinese people, Han Chinese people, that they don't allow them to express, which is connected to, I'll say about it, that would we say that how Chinese government deals with Uyghur Muslims or ethnic minorities, right? Ethnic nationalities, Uyghurs or Tibetans is different from how it deals with Han people. To an extent, yes. So if uh, uh, Han people in some towns say that this factory should not be built here because bad for our environment, right? The railway accident has led to death of our children. Can the government do something? Possibly they'll do something. So they will see the protests as protests, not as a challenge to authority. However, 
if Tibetans or Uyghurs say, can we get Tibetan language or you know, Uyghur language or whatever in our school, that protest will be seen not as a protest, it will be seen as a separatist, extremist, terrorist protest. Right? So the difference would be the same demands made by Han people would be seen as, to an extent, manageable, legitimate, and by Uyghurs and Tibetans as part of a wider conspiracy to weaken China. But ultimately, we know it that even if a Han person, a Han group, or Han Chinese people, if they stand up for human rights, they will be crushed, they'll be curbed. So the case of Liu Xiaobo, again, if you're a very young person, you may not know him, he was a Nobel uh, Peace Laureate, he died in prison. And if you look at the statements they made, I mean, come on, they, I mean, they're asking for what I would see is nothing radical. It's was very normal, simple statement, saying that basically, look, remember, Chinese dissidents are asking for something basic, treat us as human beings, so allow us rights. But even that is seen as seditious and dangerous by Chinese government. That's part of the problem here. So there's an ethnic part. Now, again, when I say China, it doesn't mean China is unique. India does something similar. You have got rising Islamophobia in India. You have got growing Hindu nationalism in India. That's my second book, right? Where it, which I wrote. There's also curbing of rights of all Kashmiri people. So China is not unique. But it also implies that given we are talking to China, I could give a lecture next time maybe on India. That's a different one. But we have to bear in mind that Ethnic minorities face extra pressure compared to that because their demands, which are legitimate, will be seen as always part of a wider conspiracy. Thank you. Um, we are actually running off time. Um, so the QA is only for 30 minutes. So uh, let's have the last two questions here. Uh, one question actually would be from um, Meng. Um, he asked about um, Tibet is support by international community. And China now has the economic capabilities to assertively penalize the countries that welcome the Dalai Lama. Is there any possible way for foreign countries to maneuver to publicly support Tibet or meet the Dalai Lama without fear of being uh, punished or penalized? Yeah, so I, that's very important. In fact, I have, I have organized things here, right? Uh, take example. Uh, the Dalai Lama has been to many universities in the US. He's elderly now, he doesn't travel much, but he has been to many US universities, Harvard, wherever, right? Those universities are never punished by Chinese government. But you will find that if in the UK, if the Dalai Lama is hosted, they'll try to punish. The fact of the matter is, you know, I don't know whether you have been bullied in school or not, you know, bullying. As I remember as a kid, I was bullied. So I was a sensitive boy and, you know, other boys will bully me and try to, you know, sort of be arrogant with me. So what we learn about bullying is that the best way to deal with them is to stand up to them. Once you stand up to the bully, most of the time they change their behavior. So I would say in this case, China is a bully. So if a university hosts him and says, fine, you don't want to engage with that, don't. You will find in 99.999 cases, Chinese government will still engage with. And I'll give a, one final example in Europe. So what would happen is, I've done some research in the past is Japan, uh, sorry, Germany, France, UK, three big countries. If Dalai Lama comes to the UK, Chinese government will cancel business delegations to UK, go to France and Germany. And then they sign MOU for 20 billion euro, 30 billion euro, right? Sounds big. So if you're a democratic leader, you'd want that investment in UK. The next time you keep quiet and you allow Chinese government delegation to come and then whatever. But what happens is, you have to notice, do research on how much of this MOU translates into actual investment. And you may find there's no data on this, but you may find that it's less than 5%. Most of these MOUs lead to nothing. So the fact is, this is largely a bluff. If universities, if governments, you know, if whatever, they hold the Dalai Lama, it will last for a few days and that will be gone. Because remember one final thing. It's not that the world needs China. China also needs the world. It's not that Japan needs China because of economic reasons or whatever, but China needs Japan. I mean, Chinese growth today, by the way, uh, you may, 1970s was primarily fueled by Japanese investment in technology. So this whole idea that, oh, we depend on China because China is rising is all a partial story. The fuller story is that China needs the world as much as the world needs China. And therefore it's time that the way China behaves with the rest of the world, the rest of the world should stand up and also behave with China. And then we may find a more peaceful, more just and more egalitarian relation. Okay, thank you. Um, well, 
before we have the last question, I want to, uh, let's say, uh, inform those students that, you know, if you raise questions here, we're going to collect those uh, questions. And I guess that I and Professor Sin will come back to you maybe um, in our classes on Isle of Asia Pacific and also South Asian Studies later. And the last question here would be from Chen Chan. And uh, the student asked about how would the US react to the conflict between Tibet and China? And this is something I also want to ask about this because uh, if you know, it seems that Joe Biden, he has a little bit different uh, approach to China regarding the policy from Donald Trump. It's not the same, but somehow it's a little bit different. And also Professor Anna, you mentioned in the PowerPoint that Tibet somehow was, seems to be a kind of one of the factors for the new Cold War between China and the US. So uh, focusing on China, US new Cold War, would Tibet be that important in the coming future? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't think Tibet would be very important as a factor in that new Cold War, in the sense that it will not lead to the Cold War. It's not going to, it's not a contributory factor. Because if you look at US foreign policy with Tibet, US like other countries also you know, goes up and down. So they supported Tibet a lot in 50s, 60s, and that support went down in 80s, 70s, 80s, you know, with the rapprochement. Then it came back in 90s, then it went down. So what it essentially shows is US looks after its own interests, right? There's no real concern for Tibet in the State Department. However, that doesn't imply that US politicians and people are not interested, right? So there's that thing. But they can't give up on Tibet that easily, is number one. So it's not a factor in terms of leading to the Cold War, but given the new Cold War, possibly, it is a factor which US will use in order to challenge China, you see? So the way is, the Tibet factor no longer leads to tension between US and China. It's not a contribute, it's not a causative factor, but it is a factor in the sense that the Cold War will, because of course, the way China will use everything possible, US will use everything possible. So take example of Uyghurs. There's a lot of concern raised about Uyghur Muslims in US, which is fair, we should do it. I support Uyghur movement and I do everything. But I we can't fail to notice that the concern for Uyghurs, like in Uyghur Muslims, doesn't also translate into concern for Kashmiri Muslims under Indian occupation or translate for Palestinians. Why? If you're concerned about Uyghurs, you should be concerned about it. It doesn't happen. It's the same with Muslim countries like Pakistan. They're concerned about Palestinians. They're concerned about Kashmir, but they're not concerned about Uyghur Muslims. So essentially, coming back to IR, schools of IR will see that world is ridden with hypocrisy. And in this context, Tibet will remain a factor in terms of how it gets used and not used. But once this tension around the Dalai Lama and the reincarnation may take place, if there's a large scale protest in Tibet, which is always possible, or at least there's an uprising, you can bet that US position is going to be more hard line than it was a few years ago. Thank you so much, Professor Anna. Um, we have tons of questions out there, but uh, sorry, we have no time to go through every question. Um, hopefully, if the COVID-19 situations can improve in the coming future. If you have a chance to come to Tokyo, we're much, you know, uh, let's say welcome you to visit us and hope that we have that chance to learn from you uh, in the coming future or in the near future. Okay, um, for every, uh, let's say, uh, participants here, uh, we will have another to uh, TRU Global Dialogue uh, in November. So if you haven't subscribed us, please uh, do that to follow our Facebook uh, and also Twitter account, and we will keep you informed. And once again, thank you so much, Professor Anna. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, man. Thank you so much.